Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen, amen, namaste. Oath or affirmation, announcements by the speaker. Honorable members, I have received communication from the Honorable Brigadier General, retired Ansel Antoine MP, member for Davide O'Meara, who has requested leave of absence for the period November 16th to 29, 2019, and Dr. Lakram Bodo, MP, member for Faisabad, who has requested leave of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the members seek is granted. Bills brought from the Senate on the supplemental order paper, the bail amendment number two bill, 2019, in the name of the Attorney General. Petitions. The member for Tobago East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to present a petition on behalf of the members of the Tobago Council for Handicapped Children of 43 to 45 Signal Hill, Scarborough, Tobago. I move that the clerk be allowed to read the petition. Is this agreed? Please proceed. Yes. To the Honorable Speaker and Members of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in Parliament assembled, the humble petition of the members of the Tobago Council for Handicapped Children of 43 to 45 Signal Hill, Scarborough, Tobago, here and after referred to as the TCHC in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, respectfully showeth one that the TCHC was incorporated by an act of parliament entitled the Tobago Council for Handicapped Children, Incorporation Act 1975, Act Number 28 of 1975, which was assented to the 29th day of September 1975. Two, that the TCHC is governed by a constitution which provides for an executive to administer its general affairs. Three, that the aims and objectives of TCHC are A, to investigate the problems of handicapped children in Tobago, B, to establish a center or centers for the care, maintenance, and welfare of handicapped children in Tobago, C, to assist in providing education, treatment, training, and rehabilitation for handicapped children in Tobago, D, to cooperate with any institutions or associations or government having objects similar in whole or in part to those of the council, and E, to do all such other acts and things as are identical to the attainment of the objects of the council and as may conduce <coughs> to the promotion of the welfare of the handicapped children in Tobago. Four, that at the TCHC 2017 Annual General Meeting, AGM, 
held on the 25th day of November 2017, it was resolved that the name of the organization be changed as the term handicapped is no longer in common use. Five, that your petitioners are desirous of amending Act Number 28 of 1975 to change the name of the organization to the Tobago Council for Children with Disabilities, as well as replace all references to handicapped children with children with disabilities to further its objectives and specifically to align the language used with the person first terminology, which is more widely accepted. Six, wherefore your petitioners humbly pray that this honorable house will be pleased to take these premises into consideration and grant leave to your petitioners to proceed with the introduction of a private bill for the amendment of the Tobago Council for Handicapped Children Incorporation Act 1975 in order that they may effectively pursue and achieve the objectives outlined. And your petitioners in duly duty bound will ever pray dated this 21st day of November 2019, signed Eastland McKenzie, Chairman, signed Dotsi Bacchus, Secretary. Honorable Members, the question is that the petitioners be granted leave to proceed. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Papers. The Deputy Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Paper number one, the appointment of the Commissioner of Police and Deputy Commissioner of Police, Qualification and Selection Criteria, Amendment Order 2019. And number two, the Annual Report of the Police Service Commission for the year 2018. I thank you. The Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Papers three to four, the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the National Agricultural Marketing and Development Corporation for the years ended September 30th, 2016 and 2017. I beg to move that papers three and four be referred to the Public <coughs> Accounts Committee. Honorable Members, the question is that Papers 3 and 4 be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. The Minister of Public Administration. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Public Administration, I have the honor to lay Paper Number 5, the Annual Report of the Public Service Commission for the year 2018. The Minister of Trade and Industry. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Trade and Industry, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Papers. Papers numbers six and seven, the administrative reports of the Export TT Limited for the years ended September 30th, 2016 and 2017. The Minister of Works and Transport. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Works and Transport, <coughs> excuse me, I have the honor to lay paper number eight, the administrative report of the Vehicle Management Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago for the period October 2015 to 2016. Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Paper number nine, the ministerial response of the Ministry of Trade and Industry to the 11th report of the Joint Select Committee on State Enterprises on an inquiry into the activities, administration, and operations of national flour mills, including the company's role in the processing of rice for local, from local farmers. Papers 10, 11, and 12, the responses to the 12th report of the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights, Equality, and Diversity on the Sexual Exploitation of, Trinid of Children in Trinidad and Tobago, with specific focus on child prostitution and child pornography. The responses are from the following ministries. 
Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Health. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Reports from committees. Member for Coover North. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the 13th report of the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities, including the THA, on an inquiry into the efficiency and effectiveness of the National Emergency Ambulance Service. Member for Tobago East. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the 19th Report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on an examination of the expenditure and internal controls of the Ministry of Works and Transport. Member for Digo Martin, North East. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have the honor to present the following reports. Mm -hmm. The report of the Joint Select Committee appointed to consider and report on the Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Bill 2018, the Tax Information Exchange Agreements Bill 2018, and the Income Tax Amendment Bill 2019 in the fifth session, 11th Parliament. I also have the honor to present the report of the Joint Select Committee appointed to consider and report on the Gambling, Gaming, and Betting Control Bill 2016 in the fifth session, 11th Parliament. Prime Minister's questions. Member for Point of Pierre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Honorable Prime Minister, given the Prime Minister's parliamentary statement on December 17, 2018, which committed to provide state lands to former Petrotrin workers for both housing as well as agricultural use, could the Prime Minister give an update on how, on how many of these workers have received land over the past 11 months? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the distribution of land under the circumstances is not as easy as distributing hops bread. It requires a certain amount of identification of the lands, preparation of the lands, and eventually, when those works are finished, those pots will be available. Madam Speaker, I want to advise you that having learned from the Karani experience where a similar undertaking was given and actions were taken to provide lands for employees in similar circumstances, and which resulted in huge scandals and losses to the taxpayer, we are making haste to ensure that such is not repeated. But we give the assurance, Madam Speaker, that having identified parcels of lands, and now we move towards getting these relevant approvals, and then there will be the infrastructural works to go in that eventually those workers would be um, allowed to have those plots as per the commitments given. It's not an overnight thing. Point up here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister, based on your response, could you state if a committee has been set up or formed to look at the allocation of these lands where it would be in, in, in the assets of Petrotrin? And if so, who, who, make, uh, who are the members of that so, committee? So I'll allow one question. Sorry, Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, yes, we have, in order to begin the process, a committee has been set up and to identify suitable lands, and that committee is doing its, its work, Madam Speaker. Supplemental member for Point Pierre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Based on your, your response, Prime Minister, could you state who are the members of that committee and headed by who? Well, Madam Speaker, the, I cannot at the moment, I don't remember exactly who is on the committee, but I, I seem to recall that there were persons we, we took from the HDC. Um, yeah. There were persons from the HDC and professional persons mm -hmm. who would have been given the assignment. And I don't want to guess, but if the certain member asks the question with the appropriate notes, I can give all those details. Supplemental member for point of fear. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Prime Minister, do you have a deadline date or a specific timeline um, for the country to get a response, or the petroleum workers to get a response? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, as I try to point out, these are not things that have deadline dates on them. 
we approach it in a, in a reasonable and responsible way, and they're step by step. And the first thing is to identify across the southern and central part of the country lands in the hands of the state which can be utilized and then seek to find out whether approvals can be had for those lands to be developed and then we have to do surveys, then we have to do infrastructure and so on. So to ask for a deadline date, no matter speaker, is just being mischievous. Thank you. Member for Point Appear. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Honorable Prime Minister, could the Prime Minister state, Prime Minister state if the Paria Fuel Trading Company has been the recipient of any value-added tax write-offs from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Prime Minister. Speaker, words have different meanings to different people. I don't want to talk about tax write-offs, but what I can tell you, Madam Speaker, is that Paria trading is exempted from the payment of VAT on fuel. This avoids the complication of sizable refunds, as is normal in the fuel sector, in the energy sector, and there's no, there's no net loss of revenue. Member for Kuba South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Could the Prime Minister inform this House what compensation, if any, was paid to Mrs. Jacqueline Wilson, former Permanent Secretary and Human Resource Expert, Ms. Fulade Matuta, Director of the Women's Institute, for Alternative Development and Ms. Eileen Green, Attorney at Law, for serving on the committee appointed to look into allegations of sexual misconduct at the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, contrary to the misinformation and the mischief being spread by the member for Kuva South and others about payment being made to these public spirited officers, no payment has been made to any of those persons. <laughs> Madam yes, Madam um, Speaker, and um, I am just searching for information, and at no point in time is I have been involved in spreading question? any mischief. Is that a question, Member for Kuba? I will now. Member for Kuba North. I will ask. Member for Kuba North, can we move on to the next question, please? Kuba North, next question. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Whether there are currently 1975 limited former workers yet to receive residential and agricultural leases? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I was told that under the last government, all of these workers had received their leases. Done. Turns out not to be true, Madam Speaker. The bottom line is, Madam Speaker, <coughs> that uh, arising out of the Karen closure and the 2003 agreement, 800, 8,000 855 residential plots uh, were, to be, were to be made available to Karani workers. To be able to deliver that on that commitment, Madam Speaker, 16 sites were identified for development of lands, meaning the building of infrastructure and so on. And of the um, 16 sites, uh, 4,000 and in fact, Madam Speaker, I correct that were 30 sites that were identified. 16 of those sites would have accommodated 4,504 workers. And of those 4,504 workers who could have been accommodated on those 16 sites on which certain works were completed, 4,274 have uh, been completed, and there are only 230 leases still have to be executed on those sites once those persons are properly identified and located. 14 sites are subject to incomplete works and are involved in serious litigation and major scandals, Madam Speaker, with respect to the infrastructure development works. There are certain court matters, there are certain investigations and so on going on. And of those sites, I'm happy to say, Madam Speaker, we are aiming that in 20, by 2020, 355 of those leases can be distributed in exchange to a site. By May 2020, a further 900 leases to, um, at the exchange to B site and picked on one. And after that, there'll be 2,271 sites that um, will be available. Supplemental member for Opuchuas. Honorable Prime Minister, are you aware that on the 28th of June 2019, 
the Minister of Agriculture answered a question, an oral question I'd asked him, and he said 400 leases were going to be bought in next week, which will take us to the first week in July, to cabinet for approval. Can you let us know how many of those 400 leases were approved? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, considering the nature of that question, I'll advise my colleague to place that um, question to the appropriate minister with the appropriate notice, and you'll get the appropriate answer. Member for Coover, no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Could the Prime Minister state what plan is in place to prevent other downstream industrial plants dependent on natural gas from shutting down? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, it is important to note that NGC has completed new gas supply contracts with Nutrien, CNC, and N2000, meaning that's eight plants in all, and is currently in advanced commercial negotiations with other downstream operators, which, Madam Speaker, is a long way from having these, having these contracts, these plants on month-to-month -month contracts, and, of course, having them with no gas supply. We have made tremendous progress here, Madam Speaker, and the progress continues. Prime Minister, what is the situation with the methanol plants that we have here in Trinidad and Tobago? How many of them are up and are negotiations being engaged for all of these? Um, Member for Karani Central, I, I don't see this as supplemental arising out of the question that was asked. Member for Kuba, no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Could the Prime Minister state at what stage is the land acquisition process for the new Tobago Airport Terminal? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, after significant investigations and preparations, the Cabinet has approved NITCO's progress with respect to the publishing of Section, <coughs> section 3 notices on the parcel of land which is of interest for this project. So NITCO is progressing along those lines. Supplemental, member for Coover North. Sure, thank you. Prime Minister, can you say how soon before these lands are dealt with properly? The lands are being dealt with properly at this time, I will speak. Supplemental, member for Coover West. <laughs> Honourable Minister, at valuation reports prepared. Um, sorry, Honourable Prime Minister. Are the valuation reports already prepared and presented to those landowners? Valuation reports. Madam Speaker, if the member will consult what Section 3 means, that, that, that answer has been given. We are at the stage of the Section 3 process, and that and certain, certain actions are mandated by law, and valuations are an integral part of that at a particular stage, Madam Speaker. The government is acquiring these lands under law, and the questions are, in fact, to be answered by saying that we are proceeding under the law. Uh, can you say what is the cost to government so far? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, at this stage we are not in a position to answer that question. The cost, the cost will emerge as the valuations appear. And at that stage, Madam Speaker, if the appropriate question is asked with the appropriate notice, we can give the down to the Senate. Supplemental, Member for Orkut West. The Prime Minister, surely I know what Section 3 means. Member. My question, my question. Well, uh, I need to ask. You allowed a question. Thank you. Yes. Yes. One minute, please. Member for Coover South. Yes. Member for Coover South. Yes. I'm sure if you exercise the proper protocols, you'll be observed. I, I will. Uh, um, this is not a conversation. Well, I. It I, is not I, a. I, Member for Coover. South, this is the last time I'm going to warn you. If you wish, if you wish, there are options that you can voluntarily exercise. Please don't let me have to have regard to the standing orders. Member for Pooch West. Are you aware that Section 3, with Section 3, valuations are done simultaneously? So the question I'm asking is that what is the cost per square foot? What is the cost per square foot that, that assessed? for the land owners, cost per square foot for the land. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I've said all that I intend to say. 
to the people of Trinidad and Tobago in this question. I don't know what lesson, I don't know what lesson my colleague is trying to give me. I have no interest in fireside law. Member for Cuba North. Madam Speaker, could the Prime Minister state whether negotiations for a new operator of the Magdalena Grand are complete? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I didn't hear the question. Member for Cuba North. Could the Prime Minister state whether negotiations for a new operator of the Magdalena Grand are complete? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, as of um, yesterday, the advice to the Cabinet is that the lawyers are finalizing this matter. They are in the last stages, I would say. And there's one document being finalized because they've exchanged certain documents. And there's one document being finalized now. And upon completion of that in the very near future, this month, in the next few days, I presume, on completion of that final document, we expect that Apple Leisure would be in a position to execute. Supplemental, member for Kumuta Mansanilla. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Could you advise who the lawyers are? Prime Minister. No, I can't advise that, but if you give notice, I'll tell you who they are. It's not in the Prime Minister's office, so I don't have that information with me. Member for Shagona West. To the Honorable Prime Minister, could the Prime Minister indicate if he's aware that the acting director of the National Lotteries Control Board has been sent on leave and or suspended this week? And if so, can he indicate the reasons for the same? Prime Minister. Uh, I've got one of these answers somewhere. Yes, Madam Speaker, my apologies. I was just looking to my papers there. The acting director of proceeded on two weeks vacation leave to allow the Central Audit Committee of the Ministry of Finance to conduct an audit into transactions and payments involving the lotto agents attached to the NLCB. Member for Naparima. Uh, thank you very much. To the Prime Minister, given the high rates of unemployment and underemployment of our youth, in fence line communities due to the closure or downsizing of major employers, such as Petrotrade. Can the Prime Minister state what specifically is being done to create jobs that align with the qualifications and experience of those affected? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I'm not aware, other than the closure of the Petrotrade refinery, I'm not aware of any closure of Petrotrin and closure and downsizing of major employers such as Petrotrin. So if that is the question, I'm simply going to refer to the refinery which has been closed. What we have done, Madam Speaker, is to have invited the international community, which involves local interests, to put proposals for the possible restart of the refinery. Once that becomes successful, Madam Speaker, we anticipate that certain kinds of jobs will become available to persons who have those skills. And other than that, Madam Speaker, we have taken steps to have certain projects initiated in and around the San Fernando area. And I could point out, Madam Speaker, for the first time, actual work is on the way towards the uh, operation of a San Fernando waterfront project which will grow in strength and character. We have a number of other projects in housing. We are also in the private sector, the Ministry of Planning and Development, approving a number of private sector initiatives for the San Fernando and environs area. And of course, overall, Madam Speaker, we work towards growth in the national economy. And we expect, Madam Speaker, at the end of the day, all such persons, as mentioned in this uh, question, would have the opportunity for advancement. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, has any study been done at all to identify the jobs that have been lost and possible replace and specific possible replacement opportunities? Or are we leaving it to VAPs? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, this government does nothing by VAPs. 
We do it by order, reason, and competence. And then in proper proactive mode, could the minister identify, the, could the prime minister identify who is doing this study um, that would identify the gaps that have been created by the closure of the company? Madam Speaker, I made no reference to any study. We have, a, we, have a whole, we have a whole of government response to this, and all government ministries that are engaged in advancement of the economy is involved in this matter. Clearly, Prime Minister, there are skills gaps that exist. And in a proactive mode, one would have identified the gaps and developed industries consistent with the displaced jobs. Member for Naprima, next question. <laughs> Given comments that the Point Lisa's model has outlived its usefulness, can the Prime Minister state whether the government is considering any review of this model? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, comments are available a dozen for a dime. Some, some comments are not even worthy of being read. So unless the member is prepared to tell me which of the comments, you're putting me in a difficult position. Can't respond to every comment being made, especially coming from him. But what I can say, Madam Speaker, is that the Point Lisa's model has not outlived its usefulness. It has been a very successful model called the Trinidad model and is acclaimed internationally. It has been adopted by several countries, especially the developing gas-based economies in Africa, what is happening at this time is that the gas value chain has been evolving to meet new circumstances. The upstream producers, BPTT, Shell, EOG, etc. These aggregate, uh, the aggregator NGC and downstream operators are redesigning the gas value chain in complex and sensitive commercial negotiations. And Madam Speaker, any person paying attention to what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago will see a model alive and well and flexible as against the misinformation being spread by those who should be struggling Trinidad and Tobago. According to commentators, and I recall immediately um, uh, Mr. Mariano Brown, the Point Lisa's model. Oh, Member for Napa, Rima, please the Point Lisa's model is based on abundant cheap gas and high commodity prices. Given system systemic challenges and abundant cheap shale gas, how do we intend to compete with the US and other major suppliers of cheap natural gas? I know you intend for it to collapse and close down. Not at this government will do everything possible. Yes. Ma Madam Speaker, it is important that we do the necessary studies and we are not caught on our way. Is the Prime Minister doing any study and scenarios to cater for any eventuality? I am studying your attempt to undermine the national interest, Madam Speaker. That's what I'm studying. Madam Speaker, it is in my intention to point Trinidad and Tobago in a proactive Singaporean mode. And therefore, we are not caught by scratch. What is your study? What is the study? Member for Naparima. No, you're just shouting. What is the study and who is doing it? We are not caught. We are not caught. Ma Madam Speaker, I have answered that question. Four times. I have answered the question. I am simply not agreeing with the attitude and ridiculousness of the member for Naparima. The Point Lisa's model that is a model which we can defend and which we hold out very proudly. As a matter of fact, as I speak to you now, the Equatorial Guinea, the Minister of Energy from Trinidad and Tobago, has been invited, and so was I, to Equatorial Guinea because they are so enamored with our model. And right? It. And that, Madam Speaker, is the same model that was there while they were in government for five years and didn't negotiate a single gas contract. Not a single contract. 
And all of a sudden, they're now talking about study. The only study they know is Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is their study. Yes. Any questions? Uh, Member for Naparima, you have one more supplemental? Yes. Yes, please. Is the Prime Minister aware at all that companies, um, downstream industries, a number of them are moving to the United States because of cheap shale oil gas, and this is a threat. What are we doing to deal with that? I would allow that as a supplemental question. Agent, questions? Women, I just ask all members to abide by standing order 53, please. Member for Point of Pierre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Education, given a threat by maxi taxi drivers to cripple public transportation on Monday in protest of outstanding payments to some drivers who are contracted by the Ministry to transport school children, could the Minister state when the Ministry intends to settle these debts as well as, as, well as the cause for the delay in payments? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Education has received releases from the Ministry of Finance to facilitate payments to the Public Transport Service Corporation for services received from the maxi taxi concessionaires. Over the last three days, the Ministry has paid PTSC in excess of $4.7 million. A breakdown as follows. Payment for the first fortnight in September 2019 totaled approximately 1.8 million and was made to PTSC on Thursday, the 21st of November 2019. A second payment of $1.8 million was also paid to PTSC on that same date, Thursday, 21st of November 2019. A third check of $1.165 million was handed over to PTSC this morning. Meanwhile, the latest invoices received from the PTSC for the period 14th to the 25th of October 2019 have been processed and, and are expected to be completed soon. Thank you very much. Supplemental question, Member Fitzgerald. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Supplemental question, Honorable Minister. Could you say how much more money will be outstanding to the number of uh, providers, maxi taxi school operators? Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, I am not in a position to say the amount, the exact amount that is outstanding. What we do, we pay in accordance with the claims that are submitted by the PTSC drivers. Thank you. <coughs> Supplemental member for Kuvan South. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Minister, could you advise us house? How many times that this um, provision of the private contractor services has dis been disrupted mm -hmm. under your watch? I will not allow that as a supplemental question. Member for Shogunas East. Can you tell us how long it takes to process these claims that are put forward to PTSE for payment? Minister of Education. <coughs> Madam Speaker, it is a long process that I've been advised that on some occasions, depending on the accuracy of the claims, it can take as much as two and a half months. Member for Point of Pierre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Education, based on reports that numerous textbooks and teaching material belonging to the Claxton Bay Junior Anglican School were destroyed due to the poor storage by a contractor during the recent work on the now abandoned school building, could the Minister inform this House whether the Ministry and or the contractor will be replacing these items, given their importance to the school's teaching operations. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Education will replace all, text, all textbooks and the teaching materials belonging to the Claxton Bay Junior Anglican School that were damaged or destroyed. Supplemental, Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In the interest of teaching, learning, and the effective delivery of the curriculum, could the minister state by when we could expect the, these matters to be resolved? Minister of Education. Thank you very much. At this 
time, the Ministry of Education is undertaking an assessment of the textbooks and, and teaching materials that have been damaged. And as soon as that <coughs> assessment has been completed, they will be replaced. Thank you. Questions on notice. Request for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance. Statements by Ministers. The Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I've been authorized by the Cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago to make the following statement. Trinidad and Tobago is in the midst of one of the most aggressive and profound reformations of the criminal justice system. No other government has sought to attack the scourge of crime by improving the whole system comprising plant and machinery, people, processes, and law simultaneously. Taking decisive action on the expansion of the judiciary, the increase in the number of judges, masters, registrars, and courts, the creation of divisions of court, the introduction of rules of court, the merger of jurisdictions of the court, the hiring of hundreds of professionals across the court system, the expansion of the prosecutorial system at the office of the DPP and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the establishment of a public defender system, the protection of witnesses, the introduction of laws to remove bottlenecks in the criminal justice system, laws to fight hard and bloody crimes, and laws to follow the money and take the profit out of crime have been driven by dedicated data capture and rigorous analysis with a focus, Madam Speaker, on the effect to the lives and consciousness of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, in addressing the reform of the criminal justice system, many have ignored the profound effect that decriminalization of certain offenses can have in the criminal justice system. The judiciary, in its publications, has demonstrated that approximately 146,000 cases come to the magistrate's court each year. Of that number, 104,000 cases are in respect of motor vehicle and road traffic matters alone. As you are aware, the government took the decision to amend the law to move road traffic offenses into violations, and shortly with the operationalization of the U-turn system of the Ministry of Works and Transport, Trinidad and Tobago will witness the removal of these road traffic matters out of the magistracy and into an electronic demerit system. Madam Speaker, the judiciary data also reveals that in the period 2007 to 2018, 84,668 cases came before the magistracy under the Dangerous Drugs Act for possession of marijuana, possession of marijuana for the purposes of trafficking, cultivation of marijuana, and the gathering of marijuana. 71,964 of these cases were for possession of marijuana alone. In the law term 2017 to 2018, the judiciary reported that 9,553 marijuana-related cases came before the magistrate's court, with 8,316 being for possession of marijuana alone in one year. Many of these cases relating to marijuana demonstrate that mostly poor and underprivileged men suffer the brunt of the hard side of the law. With 3,429 people having been remanded for marijuana-related offenses in the period 2010 to 2018, being approximately 500 people each year unable to access bail even though granted bail by the courts. The burden to the taxpayer of hundreds of millions of dollars expended in remand incarceration is as atrocious as the effect to the lives of the accused and their families. Convictions for possession of marijuana have derailed many lives as they stand as a bar to education, travel, and employment, just to name a few. The government, after significant research, wide stakeholder consultation, 
and careful legislative scrutiny is of the firm view that it is the correct time to amend the Dangerous Drugs Act and to cause the strict licensing and regulation of the research, cultivation, supply, commercialization of marijuana through the establishment of a cannabis control authority. Whilst others have flirted or failed in the 25 years since the passage of the Dangerous Drugs Act, I am pleased as Attorney General of this government to therefore witness the introduction of two bills today, namely the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Bill 2019 and the Cannabis Control Bill 2019. Together, these bills will amend the Dangerous Drugs Act and birth a new regulatory regime which will move our laws from a colonial archaic past and into the future. The Dangerous Drugs Amendment Bill 2019 seeks to define marijuana comprehensively as cannabis. To decriminalize certain quantities of cannabis and cannabis resin, to prohibit the use of the substance in public spaces, all educational institutions and places of work. It also seeks to abrogate the present strict prohibition of the administration of the substance to children in medical cases only. It also modernizes the criminal justice system by introducing a tiered penalty system premised upon the quantum of the substance in possession. Madam Speaker, under this amendment bill, a person may now lawfully grow no more than four cannabis male plants at his residence without a license. Under the tiered possession scheme, the bill proposes the abolition of the present regime whereby possession of any amount is an arrestable offense. This tiered possession scheme will establish lawful limits for possession and use. Hence, under the new scheme, a person found in possession of 30 grams of cannabis or less will no longer be arrested for possession. That being said, the government also proposes to impose an upper limit for lawful possession of cannabis or cannabis resin, respectively. That limit will be <coughs> 60 grams as proposed by this bill, Madam Speaker. The bill proposes that possession of more than 30 grams, but not more than 60 grams of cannabis, or more than 5 grams, but not more than 10 grams of cannabis resin, is to now be treated by a fixed penalty ticket system, with the brunt of the law being applied only where there is a refusal to pay the fixed penalty, and only after the possibility of community service as an alternative remedy is explored. The bill strictly criminalizes smoking or using cannabis resin in a public place. The bill also establishes specific penalties for the possession and trafficking of dangerous drugs such as amphetamines, ketamines, and LSD, only recently introduced as dangerous drugs under the Dangerous Drugs Act by this government. The Dangerous Drugs Act will also strictly criminalize acts <coughs> involving children. Hence, for example, a person who possesses cannabis, even within the allowable limits, will be prosecuted for having the substance on a school premises, a bus, or school yard. He will be liable upon summary conviction to a fine of a maximum of $250,000 and to imprisonment for five years. The government is also concerned about the effect of the substance upon persons during the course of their work and operation of certain machinery. Thus, the bill proposes to prohibit persons who, whilst under the influence of cannabis, do anything which constitutes negligence, professional malpractice, or professional misconduct. A similar prohibition applies to any person who operates, navigates, or is in physical control of any motor vehicle, aircraft, ship, whilst under the influence of the substance. In both instances, the conduct attracts a summary conviction to a fine of $250,000 and to imprisonment for five years. It follows that in the interest of justice, persons with charges before the court for the new upper limit of 60 grams 
of cannabis and 10 grams of cannabis resin may apply to be discharged and that the criminal records of persons with convictions for possession of the substance will be expunged and that they will be able to apply for pardon under Section 87 of the Constitution. Under the Cannabis Control Bill, the other bill, a state entity, the Trinidad and Tobago Cannabis Authority, will be established to administer a licensing and registration regime to legitimize, establish accountability and transparency for the use of cannabis by persons and bodies engaged in religious, sacramental, medicinal, and commercial activities. The authority will have the power to issue eight types of licenses, namely a cultivator license, a research and development license, a laboratory license, a processor license, a retail distributor license, an import license, an export license, and a transport license. Notably, as their names imply, the licenses represent different points. That is, from growth to that involving therapeutic use. There will be strict control for medicinal use and for religious purposes, which are separately addressed in the bill. Only certain persons will be eligible for licensing and registration, and there is a guaranteed minimum local content of 30% of ownership for companies and cooperatives so as to avoid the abuses that occurred with multinational domination in other territories. There are careful safeguards in the bill, Madam Speaker. With respect to religious organizations, there is the prescription for a requirement for registration under the Nonprofit Organizations Act 2019, as well as strict dispensary regime. Similarly, only persons licensed as a medical practitioner may lawfully dispense and administer medicinal cannabis. While cannabis growth and its use has desirous implications for the national purse and will surely be welcomed by the medical patient and religious communities, the government will curtail opportunities for abuse of the new licensing and registration regime. This is effected through criminalization of behavior, which adversely impacts the administration of the authority, breaches of confidentiality, unlawful disclosure of information, and undisclosed interests in businesses seeking a license and dealing with cannabis without a valid license. Furthermore, the government is mindful that while the reform allows the wider population to have greater access to, albeit limited purposes, it remains concerned that reform should account for the interests of nation's children. They must be protected from misuse of the substance. To that end, the Cannabis Control Bill 2019 protects our children by criminalizing certain activities involving children. Firstly, to all parents and guardians or caregivers of children, please note, if a child under your care suffers from a medical problem for which medical cannabis can be helpful, you are required to exercise due diligence and care. You may be criminally liable if you fail to obtain written certificate from the child's medical practitioner certifying that the child requires medicinal cannabis to remedy his ailment. Secondly, to all persons who accompany children to places of worship or similar environments, you may face the court if you cause or permit that child to use cannabis at a place of worship, a sacramental dispensary, or at an exempt event the penalty that you may be subjected to is a fine of $250,000 and to imprisonment for a term of five years. Madam Speaker, these bills laid in the House of Representatives today represent the work of a progressive government dedicated in the mission of quite simply getting it done. The benefits to the people of Trinidad and Tobago are so obvious now that the work has been done and put into context. It is axiomatic that the criminal justice system should focus on serious crime and that all roadblocks to justice should be immediately removed so that judicial and law enforcement time can concentrate where it matters most. It is equally axiomatic that Trinidad and Tobago should be anxiously conscious of the developments across the world and 
Those developments, of course, informing us that there is a recognition of the economic potential of cannabis production once unshackled from the mid-19th century colonial values. Whilst others have slumbered, Madam Speaker, we have toiled. We shall get it done. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Oro Puchis. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, today, Honorable Member, uh, pursuant to 244, um, a member, could you indicate, given your statement, that there are clearly some complex issues and provisions and new institutions to be established uh, to bring this regime into force? Given that the opposition leader and members of the opposition, in particular, I think Samuel Barataria, has already pronounced, could you indicate, with no pun intended at all, whether these measures will go to a joint select committee? <laughs> Madam Speaker, it was without mistake that I referred in the statement to whilst others slept that we have toiled. The newfound love by the leader of the opposition for this decriminalization and commercialization, perhaps not as new as one may think, betrays the fact that for a full five years and three months, the leader of the opposition, as prime minister and senior counsel with the capacity to amend law, did absolutely nothing for the benefit of the people of this country. In having created this bill, and that to, de to develop the Cannabis Authority Bill, we intend to take this to the floor of the parliament, Madam Speaker. We intend to have the debate ensue. Like any good government would, we must listen to the concerns that come out on a fairly complex issue. That is the reason why it has taken us, and in the AG's office in particular, some time to perfect the work product now before us. We welcome the newfound enthusiasm of those opposite to the reform of law. We will simply get it done. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Introduction of bills. The Insurance Amendment Bill 2019 in the name of the Minister of Finance. Honorable members, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporation Ordinance 1932 be read a first time. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Clark. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporation Ordinance 1932, the Cannabis Control Bill 2019 in the name of the Attorney General, the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Bill 2019 in the name of the Attorney General. Public business, private members' business, motions. Member for, Car Member for Carney Central. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas climate change is a matter of global concern, which threatens all nations, and whereas small island states and coastal states are especially susceptible to the impact of climate change, and whereas the Caribbean region has, from time to time, experienced cycles of drought, heavy rainfall, hurricanes, and floods, and whereas earthquakes and other natural disasters must be anticipated and prepared for, be it resolved that this House agree that the government develop a holistic and sustainable national response to climate change, inclusive of solutions to the perennial flooding in Trinidad and Tobago, and the effective management of drought conditions and the impact of such disasters on the quality of human life. Madam Speaker, climate change and sustainable development are deeply connected. And the connection of these two things has changed the conversation about economic development and successful progress. The once held argument that about capitalism being 
totally driven by consumer demand, <coughs> is, weight, is waning under the weight of the concerns of issues such as climate change and sustainable development. Now, the essence of discussion about climate change is about carbon emissions, CO2. And in our particular case in Trinidad and Tobago, the culprits, you might say, are the energy industry. Secondly, the other industries in the country, including manufacturing, uh, because we are a relatively highly industrialized country compared to the rest of the region, and of course, vehicles which travel the roadway. And the easy way of thinking of the solution is that we need to re reduce pollution and emissions from the energy industry. We need to reduce pollution and emissions from the manufacturing and other sectors. And we need to find a transportation solution that will create the conditions in which the amount of CO2 that emanates from the cars that we have here, almost a million cars, not every day on the road, but which they emit every day, will be reduced. Because all of this affects the quality of life, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food, food production and food security. Uh, it takes a toll on the quality of shelter we have to design. Uh, it takes a toll on the conservation of the environment, on land and water, and on waste management. And therefore, in taking a toll on the quality of life of our people like this, and taking into account what is happening is that we now have to manage and to worry not only about the economy, but also the environment, the people, and you might say, even all living organisms, because the philosophical base of the concern about climate change and sustainable development is that there is a connectivity among all things, as well as a connectivity among all living things. So that the talking about the weather, Madam Speaker, which we would say was small talk, has become really very, very serious business in not just in this country, but in the entire world, because of the issue and the impact of climate change. Now, climate change is also associated with global warming. And this was identified, Madam Speaker, as a problem for humanity since about 1979. Of all environmental issues, this, that is to say climate change and global warming, is perhaps the most challenging and worrisome. The situation is so alarming now that the condition is described as climate emergency. And yesterday, the Oxford Dictionary through The Guardian in London informed us that the term climate emergency has soared in usage by about 10,000% and that climate emergency is now the word of the year in 2019. And it, it describes a situation in which urgent action is required to reduce or halt climate change. They also explain that. They explain that you could put two words together to form one word. <laughs> the, so, and, or halt climate change and avoid potentially of the Karani Central. Please continue, Member. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So there is a concerted, concerted sorry, ever uh, uh, to reverse environmental damage that is 
uh, caused by climate change and its consequences. So a considered and holistic climate response <clears throat> from any country, and in this particular case we're talking about Trinidad and Tobago, is very urgent. Now, for a long time, there were two legal frameworks that govern global climate change. One was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, and the focus of that was stabilization of greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. The second one was the Kyoto Protocol, which was a legally binding framework that required developed countries to reduce <clears throat> their aggregate greenhouse gas emissions by a percentage target. As a small island developing state, since 2005, Trinidad and Tobago has been guided also by the Mauritius Declaration and the Mauritius Strategy for the Implementation of SIDS. In these two reports, 10 areas were identified as being criti of critical importance to the development of SIDS, and within this framework, 10 problem areas were identified for Trinidad and Tobago. These issues identified are still relevant to the country and require urgent attention. First of all, climate change and sea level rise, natural and anthropogenic or man-made hazards, management of waste, coastal and marine resources, freshwater resources, land resources, energy resources, tourism resources, biodiversity, and transportation. In the year 2013, Madam Speaker, when I had the opportunity and privilege to serve as Minister of Planning and Sustainable Development, that ministry, which I led, prepared a document on behalf of the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago, entitled Working for Sustainable Development progress, gaps, and opportunities for action. This document was prepared for the Rio Plus 20 conference in Brazil of that year. I do not see this document listed in the EMA's list of consulted documents for their presentation of the 2018 National Environmental Policy, and I have the EMA's list of uh, entities and documents here. I also do not see the EMA taking note of the National Spatial Strategy for Planning, which was laid in Parliament in 2013, and which accompanied the Planning and Facilitation of Development Bill, which we had the opportunity to de uh, debate the amendment for not so long ago. So much for government continuity and good governance. The document working for sustainable development of TT identified some of the most pressing concerns. I, concerns. I mentioned 10, but I'll just mention a couple that are related. The rise in sea levels, increased flooding, unpredictability of weather conditions, hillside erosion, coastal erosion and the loss of coastal habitats, and of course, the management of waste and garbage. Now, the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, took note of that same document in 2017, four years after we had pre prepared and presented it to the world, and made reference to the fact that the Working for Sustainable Development document for TT had also highlighted the economic impact of climate change on Trinidad and Tobago, which included agriculture, coastal zones, and health, which could directly impact on tourism, as well as other aspects of the wider community. So in 2013, we understood clearly that if climate change can determine, can undermine, sorry, the environment, if it could undermine 
human and community health, if it could undermine aspects of the economy, then climate change was detrimental to sustainable development in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, as a country, we needed to manage climate change if we were to succeed at sustainable development of Trinidad and Tobago. In other words, if we, as a country, do not manage and make adaptations to climate change, there is no chance of us becoming a sustainable nation. The NDC Global Outlook Report of 2019 of the UNDP, NDC, NDC in this instance means nationally determined contributions, makes this position clear on, 20, uh, on page 22. And I quote, governments increasingly recognize that action to address climate change is inseparable from delivering sustainable development goals. This is why, as a government, we undertook, at that time, the Mayaro Coastal Studies Project to identify the causes of erosion and to produce solutions to arrest the rate of erosion there. That is why, in order to preserve the Manzalina coast, coastline, our government embarked on the Manzalina Seawall project executed by the then Minister of Works, the member for Tabakil. These are but two small interventions on the eastern coast that can make a difference on the coastline, in the lives of people as well, and enhance the environment and support economic activity. That is why, as a government, we also took the decision not to allow construction on the hillsides above the 300-foot contour line, mm -hmm. another small decision that could have a positive e effect on soil erosion, silting of water courses, and water runoff that can contribute to flooding. That is why at the Ministry of Planning, we funded a biodiversity project which brought UWI and Cambridge University UK to study and catalog flora and fauna in, carefully identified, in a carefully identified area of the country. That is why we limited the development of Shagaramas to only 11% of the land in the Shag Shagaramas master plan and established a nature reserve on the remaining 89% of the 22 square mile peninsula. There are on, these are only a few of the things that we did. But as I said, we did prepare a national spatial strategy document, which was laid in this parliament in 2013. Since 2013, we have had a number of new initiatives and agreements. In 2014, for instance, cabinet sent a member of the Town and Country Planning Division, Ms. Ms. Marie Hines, along with a representative of the UN mission in New York to Samoa to a world conference on small island states where the blue economy and the importance of oceans in general were emphasized. The conference agreed on a Samoa pathway there has been follow-up on this in 2018 and 2019 at the international level. Following the Samoa Pathway Initiative, there has been the Paris Agreement signed in December 2015. The purpose of this accord is to accelerate and intensify the actions and investment needed for sustainable low-carbon future. And the central aim of the Paris Agreement is to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping global temperature rise in this century well below two degrees Celsius, and to try to contain temperature rise thereafter to even lower levels closer to 1.5 degrees centigrade. This has largely been undermined, of course, by the pullout of the agreement by President Trump after the earlier commitment of the former President Obama, both presidents of the United States. The US, by the way, is the world's second largest emitter of greenhouse gases. 
producing about 15% of global annual carbon dioxide emissions. If it does not conform to agreements to which the entire rest of the world has made commitment, it makes a big difference in both fervor and to the results. China is the highest emitter, in fact, higher than the US. And close on the heels of the United States, which is number two, there is India, Russia, and Japan. Four of the five worst offenders say they, mean, they, say they remain committed to reduction of global warming. The United States, of course, has said that it will not go along. So the world's culprits in global warming and man-made acceleration of climate change have been and continues to be the industrialized and industrializing countries of the world. The big countries, the big economic powers, and the big geopolitical players. That is the fact of our life today. And these are the driving forces in global, climate, global warming and the need to deal with climate change. Now, while those, those of us who feel the impact of climate change most, however, are and will be island countries, coastal countries, developing countries, some of them landlocked, so powerful, so, so, so you might say the powerful are causing the problem by and large, the weak and the vulnerable have to cope with the problems and find means of adapting. And responding to climate change and its effects is also a costly process. So it costs a lot for small countries to try to look after themselves and to contribute to the world. Now, the citizen of Trinidad and Tobago may well ask, what does it matter if the world gets warmer? The ordinary citizen might ask that, and it's a legitimate question. Well, scientific evidence suggests, Madam Speaker, that if the world temperatures rise by two degrees in cold areas, mountain glaciers will melt, rivers in warmer areas will dry up, and mountain regions will see more landslides as the permafrost that held them together melts away. With a continuous rise in temperatures, sea levels could rise by a meter, it is said, by 2100, and 10% of the world's population can be displaced. A lot of that population, proportionately, will be in nations such as ours that live with the sea around them. I always remember the then Prime Minister of the Bahamas, Perry Christie who pointed out at a conference that we were both present at in 2014, that the sea level around the Bahamas Islands rose, that if the sea level rose by two feet, a full two thirds of the Bahamas landmass would be covered by water. Since then, we have witnessed the devastation of Dorian with its 185 mile per hour winds, seawater flooding, 65 people died, and US $7 billion in damages were caused. Climate change, therefore, is very real. It is close. It can spell disaster for small island countries. Now, what is the relevance of climate change to countries such as ours? This is what our own Trinidad and Tobago Met Office says. Climate change is the long-term shift in average weather patterns, I'm quoting from them, across the world. Since the mid-1800s, humans have contributed to the release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the air. This causes global temperatures to rise. So climate change is man-made. It has consequences for the land, for the sea, for hurricanes, for water, for humans and their communities, and we must learn to manage it, reduce its impact, cope with it, and adapt to it. Adaptation has always been the key in the survival and triumph of any species. 
And the challenge for us in this era of accelerated climate change is to identify problems clearly and to solve them and to adapt to changing climatic water con weather conditions. Climate change occurs when changes in the Earth's climate system result in new weather patterns that remain in place for an extended period of time. That means that we have to live with the reality once it occurs. I asked a question earlier, what does it matter if temperatures ra rose? And we talked about glaciers, rivers, and sea level rise, all of which happen in the northern colder areas, but with the effect and the consequences everywhere. But what would happen on the land itself with the rise in temperatures? According to NASA, an increase of 2 degrees Celsius, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, would almost double water deficit globally and would reduce the amount of wheat and maize harvest. The message here is not about wheat and maize. The wet message here is that we can have water scarcity and difficulty in producing food no matter where we live if global warming continues. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that four degrees centigrade of global warning, warming sorry, would lead to substantial species extinctions. I quote from them, from the report, and I quote again, large risk to global and regional food security and the risk of inevitably destabilizing Green, Greenland's massive ice sheet. What does that ice sheet have to do with us? Well, it is said that if that ice sheet in Greenland is allowed to melt, the rise in seawater would be about 20 feet. And it is said that if the Atlantic ice sheet melted, the water rise would be 200, and 200 feet. So in that situation, what would happen to the Bahamas? What would happen to the Caribbean? What would happen to all the islands in the Pacific? What would happen to Trinidad and Tobago? Now, none of this will happen right away. But I think it is important to understand what we are dealing with and why we've got to take this seriously. Now, a growing number of studies indicate that growing food would be a problem. A lot of farmland in the world may become unusable because of their high dependence on water and because of sea level rise. So with global warming, we will have a scarcity of water, challenges for food production, sea level rise and loss of coastal areas, reduction of landmass and dislocation of human settlements, among other things. In a worst case scenario, we would all be living in a water world. That is why besides the more urgent climate emergency, we have global warming evolving into what is termed now global heat, because that is what global warming is being called today. Now, what are the direct consequences of man-made climate change in Trinidad and Tobago? I won't mention all, but I'll mention a few. Rising maximum temperatures is getting hotter. Rising minimum temperatures is generally warmer throughout the year. Rising sea levels, which is a threat to coast, coastal living, landmass reduction, impact on the coastline, and pleasure and leisure activities for both locals and tourists. Higher ocean temperatures, which impact on all marine species and ecosystems. And what this does is it gets warmer is coral bleaching will occur, breeding grounds for marine fishes and mammals will also be undermined. There's also increase in rainfall, which cause floods. We live with it every year. Shrinking glaciers from the north, towing the permafrost in those regions will inevitably have consequences here. Drought and water scarcity could have another consequence. And we are already witnessing more rainfall in the wet season and new drought conditions in the dry season. Now, these seven matters that I've mentioned are direct consequences. But what about indirect consequences? Mm -hmm. Water crisis of any kind unmanaged, whether 
drought, flood, or whatever can affect food production, create food scarcity, increase the price of food, and can exacerbate hunger. Think of it in Trinidad and Tobago alone. Think of it in the region. Think of it globally. And then think of what is likely to happen in terms of attitudes and behaviors if this were to become a reality. Rising temperatures and heat waves can exacerbate heat risks, respiratory ailments, increasing airborne disease and diseases and viruses, gastrointestinal diseases, mosquito-borne diseases, even liver and kidney can be affected. People with cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases can also be affected. People with depression and psychiatric disorders can also find their conditions exacerbated. Excessive heat can facilitate the spread of pests and pathogens and even what happens elsewhere, like Sahara dust from the African continent, for instance, can after the health, alter the health conditions of citizens in as far a place as Trinidad and Tobago from that continent. When I was at the University of the West Indies, there was some important research being done there with children in the medical school, and it was found that the, 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 a whole generation of children, there was a significant increase in the number of diseases that had to do with their ability to breathe and breathe properly and so on in the country, having implications not just for the generation, but for many generations, possibly, depending on what kinds of treatments were done. Loss of biodiversity can occur when flora and fauna fail to adapt fast enough to changes in temperature. Climate change affects, therefore, the air we breathe, the water we have to drink, the food we can produce, health, coastal erosion and land loss, human displacement, hillside erosion, flora and fauna destruction, trees destruction, housing and construction rethinking. All of these on their own or in combinations can have economic impacts and can cause havocs in different ways, Madam Speaker. When climate change elements combine to cause natural disasters, what are the economic costs, first of all, of dealing with the problem? Secondly, restoring some semblance of normalcy and then dealing with permanent damage and disaster. What is the human and economic cost in Trinidad and Tobago when floods occur and homes are devastated? What is the community cost? What is the economic cost of uprooted trees and demolished buildings in Dominica wrecking the lives of thousands of people on a small island? And that same hurricane in the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, none of these islands have fully recovered yet from that hurricane. What about the devastation in Abaco in the Bahamas. The human and economic costs of climate change and its direct and indirect impacts are immense. And it is a problem for us. And it is a problem that is quite significant. All the scientific evidence based on research that has been done here up to 2010 show us that, in fact, we have global warming here, that we have warmer temperatures here that it is happening here, that there is coastal erosion here. And these includes lo local scientists who are stationed abroad. It includes the Climate Change Center in Belize. It includes other scientists who are doing work in this area. Now, what the industrialized countries have done, knowing that they are the biggest culprits and knowing that they greatest recipients of the consequences of climate change are, in fact, islands, small states, and developing countries, is that they have put aside a fund, a $100 billion fund, which needs, which one can tap in in order to deal with some of the problems here. I don't know what is the extent to which Trinidad and Tobago has been able to tap into that, but I would think that not only do we have to fight these issues in the global fora and 
make the case that, for instance, the greatest responsibility and obligation is not to us, but to the larger countries to do something about it. We need to fight that. But we also need to make the case that without the technical capacity, without the technological know-how, and without the funds, we will not be able to deal with the problems that attend us in this particular country, Trinidad and Tobago, or in the other region. But there's a fourth thing, which is that unless we have the capacity, because sometimes these forms that you have to fill out, the package of things that you have to fill out, are so onerous that it's very hard to even complete it to get the benefits from it. And in that kind of situation, we need to build the capacity here to address issues in Trinidad and Tobago and to get the funds to be able to do it. Now, when, the, when this government joined the, the Paris Accord, it was in the, on the 11th April 2018. The Prime Minister then said, we didn't just rush into it. We looked very carefully at what was required of us, the cost and the effect on the country. And when we were satisfied that the arrangement was what we could live with, we did it. And we made certain commitments, etc. When you look at the Vision 2020 document, <laughs> You see things identified here, like goal one, environmental government, governance and management system will be strengthened. Goal two, carbon footprint will be reduced. Goal three, climate vulnerability will be assessed. Goal four, comprehensive waste and pollution management systems will be created. Goal five, national resource management will be improved. Now, all of these are fine, and there is really no problem with it. But the question is, when, how, where, who? All five of these seem, without support, rather vague and nebulous, and without concrete action measures. Now, there have been other things done by this government I want to acknowledge. Um, for instance, review and update of the national climate change policy. We did a policy in 2011. Some attention to forest and protected areas, a ban on styrofoam containers, a beverage container bill. I, 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 I'm not sure if they did anything for plastic. And of course, you had the issue with the LED bulbs in the last budget. Now, it also talks about a national climate mitigation monitoring, reporting, and verification system to track the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, the, oh, Madam Speaker, sorry. The reason why a citizen will be skeptical about some of these initiatives or find them sometimes comical is because of the context and because of scale. It's not that anything is wrong with them. All right, I think the, the issue is really a credibility about implementation problem and an uh, issue of scale. So the LED bulbs have become a joke, not because they do not, they do not work or they do not do what they are intended to, but because people consider the gesture too small and as a relatively isolated initiative. Then, secondly, although they understand that the LED bulb is better for the in environment, they are skeptical about its introduction. So they think, for instance, as people have said in the public space, that the plan was really for an importer to benefit rather than the citizen to benefit. So, so culture and experience drives the citizen to think in this way, which brings a lot of skepticism to even reasonable objectives. Now, let us take the reporting system for greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. Citizens will not take that seriously simply because 
the government on the other side has not reported on performance for the last four years. Even in the midst of an election season, the government on the other side will not identify exactly what they got done. Everything, everything is amorphous and vague and PR driven. In the review, um, I mentioned already that in the review and update on the national climate change policy, you left out important national documents. The beverage container bill is to come and we wait to see what will happen to styrofoam and plastics and so on. In addition, Madam Speaker, we should not blame climate change for the things that we can sh and should do and take action to address. For instance, if we know that climate change will make our country better, hotter, sorry, and that the El Nino effect will sometimes result in drought conditions, then there are man-made things that we can do through government action. We can, f we, can, we can and must first capture the water when it is abundant in the rainy season. We must store it and improve the distribution system to deploy it when water is scarce in the dry season. And that has nothing to do with climate change. In other words, we can get these things done. We can work with farmers. We know who they are. We know where they are. We know what they grow. We can work with farmers to design irrigation systems, flood relief and, and flood alleviation systems, including retention ponds to help them to be productive and protected during, throughout the year. While we do that, we might want to pursue various forms of protected agriculture as a strategy, which in smaller spaces with smart systems and a controlled environment use less water and yield more produce. Remember, one of the consequences of climate change is to manage agriculture and food production. It is a very important issue in the context of a scarcity of water together with floods. By clear action steps as a country, we can effectively triumph over heat wave and drought conditions. We can step up, set up irrigation system for traditional farmers Young entrepreneurial types can be encouraged and supported to go into smarter, protected agriculture with control systems, and a lot of problems can be solved together. In addition, for traditional agriculture, smarter systems can be designed which deal with irrigation in the dry season, as well as flooding in the wet season. So government must not, from the, not be absolved from these basic responsibilities because climate change is a reality and is affecting weather patterns. We must capture wet water in the wet season, harness it, and have it ready for deploy deployment. The perennial flooding problem, that is not something, my colleagues will speak on this, but that is not something we can simply say climate change. Yes, we get a lot of rain, but what about all the issues that we can deal with in a comprehensive, integrated matter, manner in order to deal with these things. For instance, the management of land resources, for instance, quarrying on the hills which denude the mountains and send sediment to the water courses, hillside construction by the well-to-do, slash and burn, by, in burn agriculture by the poor, we have to have a holistic approach to our mountains, hills, and hillsides, which protect the nat natural landscape, and which also protects the water courses along the way and the human settlements below. True, we have to address the issue of some people building on the riverbanks or too close to it, but this can be addressed in a solution-oriented, thoughtful, and humane manner, with sound engineering knowledge and solutions as well. And we have to plant trees on the hills and the hillsides, good for everybody. True trees absorb carbon dioxide and provide oxygen. And then we must address the issue of effective management of the limited land that we have. That is why it is important to have the Planning and Facilitation of Development Act, together with the reform of local government, the Planning Professionals Bill, the National Spatial Strategy, and national geospatial capacity, 
the Human De Development Atlas information, which is about people and locations, clear decentralization and devolution policies, regional development plans that they come together so that you can holistically bring coherence to the development process. And Madam Speaker, the way the world is going now, moving away from the traditional modes of engaging the business of development, co-development is becoming a strategy in which you have to work with people. In this country, there are 18 regions. There's Tobago and 18, sorry, eight, Tobago and 14 regions in Trinidad. But you also have 600 communities. So there's no reason why you could not have macro development, regional development, Tobago development, community development, sort of connecting and dovetailing with each other and people brought into it, which means they are better educated, better informed, they are part of the solution. And these kinds of things can make a truly great difference in terms of the management of climate change, in terms of the management of solutions to local problems, and in terms of sustainable development as a policy and strategy. Um, The, I just want to say that we also did in our time a microzonation policy, a strategy, yeah. which is now in motion. Thanks, we thank the Minister of Planning for continuing that. And that relates to earthquakes to which we are prone. We have had earthquakes in Trinidad and Tobago. One of them, I think, in the 1600s, destroyed the then capital of the country, uh, which was St. Joseph. And since then, we've had them. But there's, the microzonation will allow us not just to figure out which areas are likely to be more earthquake prone or susceptible, but it will help us with things like, uh, what you call it, the, the, the building codes and, um, and things like that. And therefore, we need to introduce a number of very important and simple things that we can do that can make a difference. The use of solar heating, for instance, in homes would make a big difference. It is trite, but we do have the sun every day. The, the issue of rainwater harvesting, mm -hmm. which you could start with in, for instance, you could have solar and rainwater harvesting in every government development. All right? You can do it in every mall that seeks to develop. You can do it in individual communities that you identify. Uh, all of these things can be done. Uh, it is true that we make our own disasters, but we can also create our own solutions, uh, Madam uh, Speaker. I do not want to offer at this point, if I ever get a chance to close the debate, I will raise some of those issues. But in this, I simply want to point to the simple things that are possible that we can do. Whether it is rainwater harvesting, whether it is smarter systems for agriculture, whether it is solar uh, development of homes and communities, etc., all of which we can do that can make a decisive difference. And the big issue, of course, would be how to deal with the CS, CO2 which would mean that you need a new economy and you need also to deal with the traffic management and cars issue. Speaker, thank you very much. Member for Shigonas, I wish to second it and reserve my right to speak. Honorable members, the motion being seconded. Honorable members, the motion being seconded, I shall now propose the question for debate. Be it resolved that this House agree that the government develop a holistic and sustainable national response to climate change, inclusive of solutions to the perennial flooding in Trinidad and Tobago, and the effective management of drought conditions and the impact of such disasters on the quality of human life. Member for Muroga, Tabela.
Madam Speaker, good afternoon. Good afternoon to members of the House on both sides. Madam Speaker, if there is any discussion or any debate in this parliament that should not descend into a to and fro, into an adversarial discussion, it is the question of climate change. Madam Speaker, the worst case scenario that is before us, if those scientists that are of the bleakest views are correct, is that there is a potential that we are facing basically a worst case scenario as a species and for the planet. Madam Speaker, when I was a child and questions of climate change and conservation and they were being debated. The whole concept, the idea, was that we need to save the planet, that the planet was in danger and we would survive by saving the planet. Madam Speaker, very wisely in the generation since, we have grown beyond that to a broader understanding that the planet will be fine. The planet does not need to be saved. In fact, the planet would survive us without a concern. Madam Speaker, I am a lover of science. I've been reading science since I was a child. Ended up not being a scientist because of a freak occurrence. But if you know any science, you understand that this planet, according to the scientists, has faced a number of mass extinctions in its past. And unless we come to terms with what is facing us, it might face another. So Madam Speaker, this is a very serious concern. This is very serious business. And I have no intention, because of the gravity, to get involved in any to and fro with the member opposite. I sat down and I listened to the member for Coronia Central present his argument on the issue of climate change. And it contained some things I expected and some things I did not expect. It contained what I will fairly call, and I do give Jack his jacket, a very coherent explanation of the situation facing the world, the situation facing the region, and the situation facing us as a very small island. It also underscored some of the consequences of climate change, the potentialities of it, and so forth. It did contain some misinformation in the sense that he talked about the greenhouse emissions not being measured. In fact, the opposite is true. It is being measured to the point where we are actually being considered globally as a best practice in terms of the measurement of greenhouse gases and their emissions, Madam Speaker. So that is true. That is a correction that I'm sure he can amend because he might do the research to find out that what I'm saying is accurate. Madam Speaker, it also contains some, of course, some what I would call veiled jabs. Now, the speaker talked about the things that were done when his party was in government and that they did make some attempt to deal with the climate change issue. And he talked about some of the plans that they had and some of the things that were enacted. He did say, to be perfectly fair to him, that they were in minutia. And then he did mention that this government has done some things also in minutia. He mentioned some issues of distrust. And Madam Speaker, I'll end there because I'm not going that way. Because we're not about that this evening and we really ought not to be about that. I will take at face value the fact that the member for Karuni Central in bringing this motion forward is sincere about the threat posed by climate change and is concerned that as a society, not just as a parliament or as a government or two opposing parties, as a society, we ought to treat this with the seriousness it deserves, and then we ought to plan to deal with the circumstances that face us. And I will accept that as fact, and I will move on from there. Madam Speaker, the member said something very interesting, and I, I started me thinking about it. I liked that he tied the idea of the argument of climate change to the idea of sustainable development. And that is very important. Madam Speaker, it used to be the notion on this planet, small economies, large economies, that there was a 
clear demarcation. They were mutually exclusive. The idea of developing your society and protecting the environment were considered mutually exclusive. They could not coexist. Madam Speaker, I remember in secondary school, a teacher saying to me, and it had never occurred to me, and it caused me to do some really think, deep thinking, that every time you see a picture of, for example, England is the perfect example, but also parts of Western Europe, also parts of the United States, where you see these nice green rolling fields that look very lovely, very pristine, as if they were massive golf courses. That at one point, those things used to be forests. Those, that would have been forested land. And because of the Industrial Revolution and because of the need for fuel, those forests were destroyed in order to sort of catalyze progress. So, Madam Speaker, it used to be on this planet that progress meant directly environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. And that was the norm. And there was a kind of hypocrisy involved in that. The hypocrisy was that nations that had destroyed their natural environment, because what they have is a sort of an a end result of that, were criticizing upcoming nations, developing nations, or as they call them, third world nations, a term I've always disliked because people misunderstand what it means or what it meant. You would be criticized for trying to do the same thing, which was using the resources you have to try to develop your nation. But the world has changed, and times have changed. And Madam Speaker, we are living it now. The member talked about the typical citizen understanding or not understanding or mistrusting or trusting government in terms of climate change. Madam Speaker, I have a lot more confidence in our citizens. And Madam Speaker, given the state of the world today as it impacts on us, the typical citizen in Trinidad and Tobago does not need to be overly convinced that the climate is changing. They live it, they see it, they talk about it every day. If you listen to them, Madam Speaker, they are aware that something is happening. Madam Speaker, I remember the 1980s, you would live for a day of sun. And a day of really, really, really hot sun was 31 degrees. And kill you dead, you were in the hottest sun possible, and it was really hot. Madam Speaker, 31 degrees is now a cool day in Trinidad. The average temperature in the shade, as every member here will know, is now 34, 35 degrees. And that is normal. 20 years ago, that would have been an anomaly. So, one doesn't have to make an exaggerated case that the planet is warming and the, planet, the climate is changing. Citizens can see it. Madam Speaker, when I was in school and doing geography, we were taught something very simple in terms of the climate of countries like Trinidad and Tobago, that we had two seasons, a wet season and a dry season. Madam Speaker, if you live in this country now, that no longer exists. That is a, that is a remnant of the past. The fact that teachers are teaching that in geography is really history in geography they're teaching. Madam Speaker, that no longer exists. Madam Speaker, in Trinidad and Tobago today, rain falls anytime. The sun shines anytime. Or worse, the rain doesn't fall at all. And instead of one period of pretty karem during the year, which used to be in September, which you could prepare for and predict, it is now the case that you could have pretty karem throughout the year. Madam Speaker, right in front of our eyes, and not my eyes as someone who is perhaps trained to observe, but right in front of the eyes of the average citizen, the typical person, this thing is happening. Madam Speaker, last week I was on the beach in Grand Chimay, well, two weeks ago, on the beach in Grand Chimay. That's very, school, very close to the school I used to teach at, so I taught literally maybe 200 meters from the coastline, literally. I would have lived three miles from there all of my life. And the coastline I knew, Madam Speaker, in just my lifetime, I'm 44 years old, place I would have visited as a child and basically spent all of my youth and much of my adult life around, has changed so much that it is almost not recognizable. 
But I was speaking, I stood on the beach just two weeks ago after CPEP cleanup, and I looked at what used to be a headland. When I was speaking, when I was a child, and there was a bazaar or a harvest or something close to the Catholic church, which was the major church in the community, people would go and sit on top of that headland. And they would basically be above the water because it's extended way out into the sea. And they would go on top there and sit and picnic and fly kites and all of that. Madam Speaker, that headland no longer exists. It is gone entirely. It's just a small stack, and I would suggest that maybe in a few years, that stack will be gone. Madam Speaker, there's, a, there's another school that was the neighboring school of my school that is, used to be a few meters from the beach, or maybe 50 meters on the beach. It is now on the beach. Literally, I could predict, Madam Speaker, before I leave this planet, where that school is now, which is the Muruga IRC school, will be in the water. And the church that is one of the most historical sites in Muruga will be gone. And Madam Speaker, that coastline is eroding so quickly. Because if you come to Muruga, it's really sandstone. It, it's not rock like you would find in the northern Caribbean islands where they are igneous islands where it's really volcanic rock. It's not even limestone like Tobago, Barbados. It is literally sandstone. So it provides absolutely no resistance to water generally. And then given the fact that we might have minute rises, a minute rise in terms of the sea level, Madam Speaker, my friends have been making a joke that the map of Trinidad that we knew as a child no longer exists. And that joke is not a joke. It is true. What we know as Trinidad is now maybe art more than geographical reality. And, and this is what we're living with. Madam Speaker, it used to be in the Caribbean that a hurricane would be a category two or a category three. A rare, rare, rare thing would be a category four. A category five hurricane used to be a generational thing, something you only heard about. When I speak, I grew up with my grandparents told me that in 1966, some hurricane hit Trinidad, and that you could literally see miles. So you could stand in Basti, and you could see all the way to Marak, which I find fantastical, was probably greatly exaggerated. But I'm wondering. I'm wondering. 63? Well, long before my time. But thanks. I'm, Madam Speaker, I'm wondering. And that doesn't affect us so far, not because of that God is a training nonsense we like to say in Trinidad, but because we have the good fortune of geography. We are very southerly. But Madam Speaker, given the fact that a Category 5 hurricane is now the norm, we have them coming back to back like Maxis in the Caribbean, to the point where many of our northern Caribbean neighbors, you wonder at what kind of sustainable civilization they will have going forward. Because before they can rebuild, another one hits. And there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Madam Speaker, I've been alive long enough not to be moved by disasters. I was in Montserrat, and the volcano exploded. It wasn't a major explosion. But it was enough for me to test the strength of my heart. And Madam Speaker, being close to an ash and cinder volcano is a very illuminating and, and thought-provoking thing. But at least I could jump on a boat and come back to Trinidad. Madam Speaker, I saw the pictures of Bahamas. And even after being told verbally of the kind of devastation, seeing those pictures, seeing that footage is absolutely mind-boggling. You have to wonder about the force of wind that could rip a wing off a plane and hurl it into a terminal. The kind of force required to do that. And Madam Speaker, that would have been something that happened every 30 years, every 40 years, a freak occurrence. Now it is something that we can literally sit down and predict year after year. Madam Speaker, it's not the case here. Well, so far. Fortunately, it's not the case here. But it is the case in many places in the world that now when a fire starts, it is almost impossible to put it out. Fires are burning in California as I speak right now. Australia. It used to be, Madam Speaker, that there were some parts of the world that had dry winds. If you go to places like 
Portugal, Spain. There are dry winds that come across the Sahara, one called the friend, and if that comes, fire start. But you could predict that. You, you knew when they would come, and you just had the laws in place, no lighting of fires, and you really hope for the best. But those things were predictable, and you could deal with them in a sort of a coherent and an organized way. Madam Speaker, this is now the world we live on. And Madam Speaker, we have as a species, not a nation, not a people, not a region, as a species to understand what we are facing. Madam Speaker, climate change appears to be a very big thing, a very complicated thing. Well, actually, it's a very, very simple thing. We live on a planet that we've affected in ways that are not to our benefit. And unless we start changing the way we operate, the circumstances that we created will make our lives not sustainable. And that is a frightening and sobering fact. To some, it sounds like something so fantastic that it could not be real, so that there are people who would label themselves as educated and logical and thinking who do not believe the science of global, um, the, do not believe the science of climate change, and their political thinking, for want of a better term, determines the actions of some of the most powerful countries in the world, putting all of us in peril. But Madam Speaker, we may not be able to affect what the United States does, what China does, what India does to some extent, we may not be able to affect that. We do not have the power or the clout or the size or the military backing or the financial backing to influence the policies of these large countries. But what we can do as a society, not as a government, not as a parliament, as a society, as a people in this country, is ensure that we don't add to the problem. Madam Speaker, my mother had a simple philosophy in life that she has passed on to me. And the philosophy was, in life you will face problems, there will be problems, there will be large problems that you will not be able to solve. But the least you should do is not add to the problem. So if you can't be the solution, do not add to the size of the problem. And Madam Speaker, that would be a very wise philosophy for us to follow. We can't affect the global situation because if we are being realistic, Madam Speaker, if this country does everything it can do, and we are doing, we are not sitting pat on our hands, doing nothing, and saying, well, it's out of our hands. We're not doing that. We are doing. But if you understand the situation as it is, we need to be realistic. If this nation, with its 1.4 or 1.3 or whatever the number is, when the census comes out, we'll know the accurate figure. If this nation does every single thing it can do to combat climate change on a global scale, and the larger nations that are really central to the problem do not amend their policies and do not act differently, the impact will be so small as to be irrelevant, negligible. But that does not mean that we don't do our part for many reasons. Madam Speaker, one of the things we have to start doing now, today, going forward, is we have to start building differently. And in this case, and in this area, education is a very good place to look at. Madam Speaker, in the last iteration of the last government, and perhaps even before, we started making the cardinal error of building schools that are not suited to our climate. So it is not the case that we have these very large schools, and I went to one this morning. It's a very nice school. It, very, it, it looks attractive. But looks and purpose are not always the same thing. We build these very large shoeboxes that are attractive. They look like schools that you would see in the United States. To me, they look like big factories, but that's another issue altogether. That's a different argument in terms of the efficacy of buildings and aesthetics and what role they play in education, but that's another discussion for another day. The big, these very big boxes that literally have no purview to allow air to pass through, and they have to be air conditioned. 
Now, that presents a number of problems. When Karen goes, school done. So if Karen goes at half past nine in the morning, that's the end of school for the day. So we built something that is tremendously expensive, something like 200 million per school. And then half past nine in the morning, Karen goes, school done. You have no school. Madam Speaker, even in the midst of crisis, even in the midst of an extinction level event potentiality, I still believe that there is room for opportunity, not just to preserve the climate, but also to do the kind of sustainable de development that the member for Karani Central was hinting at. Madam Speaker, we have to start building differently. We have to build different schools. We have to build schools in a way that require them to use less power, that require them to use space more effectively, that require them to have more natural lighting, that let them use more solar power. Maybe there's purview for wind power, natural ventilation. Now, the planet is warmer, so the whole, you open the window and you have normal class may not be the same or may not be as possible if the planet keeps heating. But this is an opportunity for us to develop technologies, develop, Madam Speaker. In the midst of a crisis, there is always opportunity. Even in an extinction level crisis, there was always opportunity. And it allows us to do something different that maybe the member didn't really explain or get, or get to what we really need to do. Madam Speaker, it, Madam, the member talked about sustainable de development and tied it inextricably to climate change. And that's good. But the sustainable development argument is a larger argument. Part of the reason why we're not sustain, or we should not really, if we are really honest with ourselves, consider ourselves to be a sustainable economy is because we are still sort of trapped in that whole paradigm of selling raw materials overseas. We don't really do any research or enough research. We don't do sufficient development. We don't, we have not yet moved beyond that hewer of wood and draw of water category. We might be selling a better product. We might be selling a more lucrative product, but we're still trapped in that, the same paradigm that started off our history. It's just not sugar and tobacco anymore. It's oil and gas. We haven't added any enough value, or there is potential for us to add more value with our ingenuity. Madam Speaker, if the planet keeps getting hotter, keeps getting warmer, certain adaptations will be made if we have to. But I would suggest in countries like ours, there is great scope for research into air conditioning. Perhaps we could develop new technologies. We could develop new ways of doing it. We could develop better, cheaper forms of air conditioning. We may have to. But it must not just be that we are always going to be the people who import a product from somewhere else, wholesale, we sell it here, and we add no value. Perhaps in the midst of this crisis and dealing with it, there is a potential for us to become the innovators that we could be, the innovators that we can be, to add some value, to create some things, to basically create the kind of technologies that will allow us to have a sustainable society here in the midst of whatever turmoil is happening. Madam Speaker, it's a cliche, but even cliches have their uses. We need to reduce our carbon output. And we need to do that nationally. We need to do it in terms of our industries, which are polluters by their very nature. But in a broader sense, we need to do it as people. And that is every single citizen doing or practicing the kind of conservation or the kind of understanding that allows us to reduce the negative impact on the planet. And Madam Speaker, central to that is education that builds upon what people already see and understand. But we need to get our society to understand the importance of this thing. And in there, there is a cultural problem. Madam Speaker, it always annoys me. It continues to annoy me. It will always annoy me to drive behind somebody and to see them throw trash out the window. I'm sure it annoys all of us here. And the, the, the most jarring part is the same citizen who will throw garbage out their window in this country, 
will go to America or Canada and say, oh, this place is so lovely and clean. It's so nice. Why couldn't Trinidad be like that mm -hmm. while they throw their garbage in the bin there? Uh, and then they will come back here, go and buy their KFC, take a drive, and revert to throwing it out the window. Why not speak there's a particular culture in that? And if I were really going down that road, I could talk about slavery and contempt for environment born out of slavery and having a contempt for your surrounding and us not growing beyond that as a people. But we ain't here for that today. Madam Speaker, en enslavement, sorry, enslavement, not slavery. I can talk about that as disassociation of the mind that allows you to not respect your environment and see it as yours. But we ain't here for that today. So what I will say, Madam Speaker, we need to educate. We need to educate. Now, nah, the, let's get bow when I talk sense. So I want to keep it simple. Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker. It's always good. <laughs> Madam Speaker, so we have a culture that is problematic. We have people who litter. And the fact that they litter means that they have contempt for their environment. And the fact of that means that getting them to understand that how important this environment is, is going to be a bit of a challenge. But also, given the fact that they are facing the differences in the environment, there is an opportunity for us to reach the common, what we ridiculously sometimes call the common man and the common woman. Madam Speaker, we have to educate them. Because it's going to be a leap taking the KFC letterer to become the person who reduces the carbon, the carbon full step. But we have to do it. Because, Madam Speaker, many of us tend to be pessimists by nature. We are a very complaining country. Very, very complaining country. But as a species, and I don't mean Trinidadians alone, I mean the whole world, we've tackled this kind of problem before. All of us here who were born, in, born before the 80s, lived during the 80s, remember, we need to stop the hole in the ozone layer. Madam Speaker, I sure remember that. That it was this hole in the ozone layer that was getting wider and wider. The ozone layer, of course, protects the planet from ultraviolet rays and other dangerous rays. And if we did not you know, close that hole, it could have led to another, a previous extinction level event. Um, and as speaker, as a species, we got rid of the CFCs. We got rid of the dangerous chemicals that were ex exacerbating that situation. And whereas the hole is not entirely closed today, it is at a point where it is no longer a threat to life on planet Earth. So there is hope. And Madam Speaker, if we could, if we could educate the business people, not the citizens, the business people, to, not, to understand that the, the things they put in their aerosols were dangerous to the planet, and they could understand it to the point where they weren't just thinking profit, 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 but they understood that Saving the planet was, if you do have a planet, you can't make a problem. And they could make the adjustments. It means, Madam Speaker, that we could educate everyone on the planet to understand this thing is serious and to deal with it. Madam Speaker, I, I have seen a 16-year-old girl, she's 16, turned big 16, sail across the Atlantic on a you know, wind-powered boat. To come to the United States and to make a point about climate change that was full of so much angst and so much anxiety and so much fear and so much emotion that it was difficult for someone like me who tends to treat things as blasé sometimes not to be affected by it and not to see it through her eyes. Because Madam Speaker, I'm 44, I'm kind of old already, so I could simply say I got dead long before this thing happened. But to understand her paranoia as a young person who has to live her whole life with this threat, it kind of forced me to look at it through a, a, a very different lens. So Madam Speaker, if we're going to stand in this parliament and talk about climate change, I'm not coming here to have any argument with any member about any minutia, any minute details about what government didn't do, or what we're going to do, and we better than you on climate change, and you better than us on climate change, that is nonsense. That is absurd. That means we are treating something that should be of, we treat it with absolute gravity, with a sort of triteness and nonsense that is not deserving of any parliament. Madam Speaker, 
As a species, we've done very well to survive this far on this planet. We've modified the planet to suit our life. <clears throat> Remember for Maruga, Maruga Tibelan, your original speaking time is now expired. You're entitled to 15 more minutes to wind up your contribution. So if you wish, you may proceed. Madam Speaker, thank you. We've, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, we've, we've, as a species, we've done well on this planet. We've modified a harsh environment to some extent. We've transformed it in our own way to make it amenable to us being here. On these very small islands where it was once thought there was no worth and no value, we've created value when none previously existed. And I've always said in this parliament that Caribbean society was really meant to be a smash and grab thing. We were meant to produce sugar, and when it was done, we would just vanish. Madam Speaker, we are still here 500 years later, and even though the odds have always been stacked against us, we've always survived, and we've always found ways. Madam Speaker, if there is any time in our history where as a people, we need to grow up, we need to mature, we need to stop fighting nonsensical fights on big issues, we could fight nonsense when it's nonsense time, and there's plenty of time for that. But we need to come together collectively to deal with a big situation that affects all of us. Because, Madam Speaker, if the sea raises by 10 feet, it's not going to ask, are you UNC or PNM? Can I drown you? It will drown all of us. And we will drown in our foolishness. If it is, that as a people, as a collective, we could put our brains together and do the kind of thinking, do the kind of planning, do the kind of researching, maybe for once in our history, not buy someone else's technology, but create ours, then in our own small way, we will do our best to ensure that we don't add to the problem. And then we could hope that the larger countries elect politicians with brains in their heads that will make the decisions that will help to save all of us. And Madam Speaker, if we do that, then as a species, we have a chance. And then somebody else will not be looking at our bones and fossils and saying, ah, there were humans once here. Madam Speaker, I thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to congratulate my colleague, the Honorable Member for Kearney Central, who is not only the author of this motion, but also the author of a book on sustainable development, mm -hmm. thinking it through, making it happen. Madam Speaker, I rise to, to lend my support to this motion which reads as follows, whereas climate change is a matter of global concern, which threatens all nations, and whereas small island states and coastal states are especially susceptible to the impact of climate change, and whereas the Caribbean region has from time to time experienced cycles of drought, heavy rainfall, hurricanes and floods, and whereas earthquakes and other natural disasters must be anticipated and prepared for, be it resolved that this house agree that the government developed a holistic and sustainable national response to climate change inclusive of solutions to the perennial flooding in Trinidad and Tobago and the effective management of drought conditions and the impact of such disasters on the quality of human life." End of quote. Madam, Madam Speaker, as I indicated, I want to express my, my heartfelt thanks to my colleague, the Honorable Member for Kearney Central for bringing this motion. It is a very timely motion in the context of what is happening globally. And, and I particularly liked the response of the member from Maruga Tableland when he indicated that there is need for amity in this house in tackling such a grave situation, that this global phenomenon of climate change. Madam Speaker. First time, first time sounded. Madam Speaker, <laughs> and I, I, I particularly am interested in the lamentation of the member about the, our culture, mm -hmm. 
And we too share that point about littering, but littering has been with us since the litter act of the days of Kamaluddin Mohammed passing that as the Minister of Local Government, but the enforcement mechanism simply non-existent. The, the member also spoke about a mechanism, of, uh, spoke of collective, the need for collective approach. I would like to find out Really, what is that mechanism? Is it going to be a joint select committee? Is it going to be a blue ribbon, a blue ribbon committee that will let, and where is the leadership for that going to come from? Because is, we can speak and lament about the situation and talk about the various correlation of events that are taking place from hurricanes to earthquakes to fires. But we need to act locally while we acknowledge the global phenomenon that is taking place. And that, therefore, the mechanism for local action is absolutely necessary. Madam Speaker, I know my colleague, the member for Maruga Tableland, had a problem in, 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 in the, what we said that we did with, during our period. But it is a matter of fact. It is not a matter of. A, OK, or very well then. He says he doesn't. And I want to merely indicate that I, whilst I had the honor and privilege to be Minister of the Environment and Water Resources, we did certain things. For example, when the member spoke about uh, the, uh, the ozone layer and its depletion, we are members of the Montreal Protocol. And we, we, we had all the ozone depleting substances phased out. Mm -hmm. We placed a ban on all equipment, all equipment using hydrochlorofluorocarbons on January 1st, 2015. Introduced a quota system and phased out HCFC on January 1st, 2013. And implemented a ban on the importation of methyl bromide to be used for fumigation or any purpose other than quarantine and pre-shipment on January 1st, 2015. In the context of biodiversity, Madam Speaker, we took very public and we uh, actions, and which are well known, include, and which included a two-year moratorium on hunting, implemented in an effort to protect our wildlife population, a new wildlife policy, a transitional plan for the transformation of the forestry division into the new Forests and Protected Areas Management Authority, a program of reforestation of denuded state lands and forest reserves was implemented and started. Work began also on a national forestry inventory and forest cover map. Through the EMA, the Environmental Management Authority, we implemented in the river swamp restoration, carbon sequestration and livelihoods project, which operates in the project committees of communities of Beach, Cascadu, Kernahan, and Plumetan. Through the Institute of Marine Affairs, we instituted the Caribbean Coastal Monitoring Productivity Program for the assessment of fishing communities, the monitoring of the coastal wetlands and seagrass beds of Trinidad and Tobago, mangrove monitoring, sea level monitoring, valuation of ecosystem services, investigation into bacteriological water quality at popular recreational water use areas in Trinidad and Tobago. Development of, of coastal vulnerable indices, development of satellite based indicators for marine ecosystem management in Trinidad and Tobago. A coral reef early warning system on Speyside Reef was also installed to ensure coral reef monitoring. Research and public awareness on marine invasive alien species. And I am reminded by my colleague, we dealt with the invasive species of the lionfish. Through the MET services, an automated weather observing system, a new digital barometer at the forecast office, a weather pod at the forecast office, uh, an UV sensing system. M Madam Speaker, our climate change and environment policies went further mm -hmm. to include new initiatives with the coastal zone management in both Trinidad and Tobago, and a coral reef early warning system was installed at Buco Reef. Through solid waste management, in February 2015, Cabinet approved the National Waste Recycling Policy, which was developed by the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources. Yeah. Madam Speaker, and I can go on, Madam Speaker, with, with respect to the Draft Waste Recycling Bill, which is the framework legislation for the establishment of the Waste Recycling Management Authority. Madam Speaker, 
But what we are faced with cannot be dealt with in the context of only policy measures. Correct. Because we are faced with, really, in the Caribbean, of which we are part, and in CARICOM, an existential threat to the nature of our society and to the existence of our communities. For example, Madam Speaker, in, in the period 2000 to 2017, there are about nine major disasters in the Caribbean. So that, and, and those major disasters move from about 33% of GDP to 227% of GDP. So that you have serious problems as to the existence of this of small island developing states as a result of climate change. And Madam Speaker, what is this concept of climate change? You know, this concept of climate change, really sometimes people, they, you, you may be, as my colleague, the member for Kearney Central spoke about it in the context of the weather. But it is clear, Madam Speaker, when you look at the learning worldwide, the unprecedented changes in climate are taking place. And if we continue on our present path, here and in other parts of the world, life on Earth will be inextricably altered. The very sustainability of Earth's life support system is now in question. How did we arrive at this pivotal point in our history? Madam Speaker, the learning points us to indicate for millennia, the Earth's climate remained unchanged or with very little change. Early human beings thrived in the, with, with the abundance of flora and fauna. They made their living and they domesticated animals for their own use. They had fire and they utilized the wood. They, they cooked their food with the wood and the, in the northern hemisphere and cold climates, they, they warmed their dwellings with wood. This wood was the, the product of photosynthesis, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and its conversion into living organic matter. Burning the wood returned the same quantity of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. In other words, human activities had little more than local impact. Natural changes occurred in the Earth's climate, but they were gradual, occur occurring over tens of thousands of years to, to millions of years. However, Madam Speaker, some 200 years ago, things began to change. Modern medicine and improvements in technology led to a human population explosion. And at the same time, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas became the energy source of choice, facilitating rapid industrialization and further fossil fuel consumption. Madam Speaker, it is scientifically acknowledged that fossil fuel burning over the last 150 years has increased the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide by 33%. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that traps heat in the low atmosphere, keeping our planet warm. Madam Speaker, it has been established that if we continue our heavy dependence on fossil fuel, we will double the pre-industrial atmospheric carbon dioxide level in a few decades, and perhaps triple it by the end of this century. As a consequence, by most estimates, the planet will warm to a level never experienced by human beings previously. So it is clear that if we continue on our path, there will be consequences. So our welfare, as human beings, is inextricably linked to the health of the planet. Our health and survival depends upon a favorable climate for productive agriculture, supplies of fresh water, forest products, and fish. Climate change will impact upon the global economy and the local economy. So Madam Speaker, this human-induced climate change is now a recognized phenomenon. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change says this, and I quote, climate change is a change of climate 
that is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and which is, in addition to natural climate variability, observed over comparable time periods. So what you have is that climate change in the context of this warming is re directly related to human and what is called anthropogenic activity. But what is protecting us and what has protected us, Madam Speaker, it is the Earth's atmosphere. And, the, and it is clear that it is the physics and the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere that largely determines our climate. So, Madam Speaker, when you look, if you're outside, and you look up to the heavens, you will think that the Earth's atmosphere is really a huge reservoir capable of absorbing almost limitless quantities of our industrial emissions. The Earth's atmosphere, Madam Speaker, is really a thin film. Indeed, it is said that if the Earth's atmosphere was shrunk to the size of a grapefruit, if the Earth was shrunk to the size of a grapefruit, the atmosphere would be thinner than the skin of a grapefruit. So you understand the context of scale. And in order to appreciate the impact of greenhouse gases, in order to appreciate the impact of the warming that is taking place, we need to find out and to build awareness as to the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. In the lower atmosphere, Madam Speaker, when you look up, from the surface to about 11 kilometers altitude, this is what is called the troposphere. The temperature decreases with altitude. So you would have learned, Honorable Member, for Diego Martin Northeast, that in the troposphere, that for every 300 feet rise in altitude, you have a degree drop in temperature. And of course, for those who live in Lady Chancellor, they will have a, a further lower degree drop in temperature. So the higher you go in the troposphere, the colder it gets. That is elementary, and you learn that in, 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 geography. in geography, yes. all of us at, at high school. This troposphere, Madam Speaker, is where dense, cold air operates on the basis of a warm, less dense air. Okay, it is therefore unstable. So it is from zero surface to 11 kilometers, and that is why you have turbulence when you are in the aircraft at certain levels, below that level, or within that level. But, but this troposphere contains 99% of the Earth's atmosphere, 99%. The second element is called the stratosphere. That is from 15 to 50 kilometers upwards beyond that the, 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 the troposphere, where temperature increases now with altitude, resulting in a stable upper atmosphere, which accounts for 1% of the atmospheric mass. So from the, the, the 15 to 50 uh, kilometers, the stratosphere, temperature decreases with altitude. Above that, you have the mesosphere and the thermosphere. They, do, they have no effect on climate change. I am laying the scientific basis, Madam Speaker, in order for us to appreciate that when we do the kind of carbon dioxide production, what impacts upon this atmosphere. So Madam Speaker, as a result of burning coal, oil and gas, and clearing forests, there, human beings have greatly changed the chemical composition of the thin atmospheric layers. And that is what is called the greenhouse effect. Mm -hmm. So when you change the composition, then you, then you create what is called the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is the warming of the Earth's surface and the air above it. It is caused by gases in the air that trap energy from the sun. 
These heat-trapping gases are called greenhouse gases. I will now deal with the, combi the, the gaseous combi uh, combination of the atmosphere. Madam Speaker, the Earth's atmosphere by volume so is 78.9% nitrogen, oxygen 20.95%, and argon 0.93%. However, it is the rare trace gases, that is carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, and the ozone and water vapor, with its high variable abundance, have the greatest effect on our climate. It is these gases that influence the radiation or net heat balance of the Earth. So it is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water vapor, ozone, that they impact upon climate change. And when, when you, and methane, because when they tell you, Madam Speaker, they said, change your diet so that you must eat less beef or less animal product. It is because of the methane production by the cow herds. So these are, the, these are the elements, and carbon dioxide, the level of emission in Point Lisas makes us the, one of the highest per capita producers of carbon dioxide. So, so Madam Speaker, and we are not saying that, and that therefore there are, there's, uh, as my colleague, the member from Maruga Table indicated, there is need for collective action. But there's need for leadership in that collective action so that the, we could take that carbon dioxide production and find a way to sequester it and therefore lower our carbon production. And that is our contribution to the global phenomenon of uh, warming. So Madam Speaker, when we look at, at what is happening and we explain this context, we now move now to what is happening locally. I think my colleague spoke about the National Climate Change Policy, which is a, a, a good document that was, uh, 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 which was brought into place in 2011 yeah. under the People's Partnership uh, Administration. That's a matter of fact. But I'm speaking of most recent publication, most recent publication entitled Vulnerably, Vulnerability and Capacity Assessment report Trinidad and Tobago, January 2019. Madam Speaker, I will seek your leave, because this is a scientific document under 4410, to read liberally for purposes of the debate. Madam Speaker, this is a, a document done in con conjunction with the, the Ministry of Planning and Development. And it is really, uh, really a, f a first class document because it deals with what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago today with respect to climate change. It deals with the, it went through a process of observation and analysis, scientific analysis. At page two, Madam Speaker, it says, the figure below represents, presents a summary of the general circulation models, GCM, and regional climate models, outputs from the climate modeling work recently conducted for Trinidad and Tobago, outlining some of the possible changes that can be expected to key variables of the local climate. Temperature, an increase between 2.4 to 3.6 degrees centigrade. Annual rainfall, a drop in annual rainfall, right, some 22 to 30%. Monthly rainfall to minus 40 millimeters or an increase to seven millimeters. These are the projections. Sea surface temperature to an increase of 0 0.9 degrees centigrade to, to 3.1 degrees centigrade. Sea level rise between 75 to 126 centimeters. Now, these are the, the projections of this study done in conjunction with the European, 
Union. Madam Speaker, and they go on to, to indicate, and it is important, we, we put this on the record. Sea level rise, or SLR, of, a, of around 1.5 to 3 millimeters per year has been observed at tidal gauging stations around the Caribbean. Although vertical land movements may sometimes exaggerate SLR, model projections are currently very uncertain regarding future rates of sea level rise due to difficulties in predicting the melt rates of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. IPCC projections range between 0.18 to 0.56 millimeters by 2100 under Emissions Act. Storm surge heights will be increased by the underlying increases in sea level. These increases are likely to be enhanced by any increases in hurricane and tropical storm intensity. So sea level rise, exposure, risk. Madam Speaker, next, one, next item on, on this study, natural coast and marine resources. Coastal habitats are being threatened by both direct and indirect impacts. The former includes habitat loss or, fragment, or fragmentation, notably from land claim, land use change, mangrove forests, as well as overfishing and destructive fishing, both of which can lead to major changes in ecosystem structure and function. Indirect impacts include many land-based activities that affect sediment, nutrient, and pollutant, pollutant levels in coastal waters. Coastal ecosystems of Trinidad and Tobago are certainly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. These impacts are expected to stem from rising temperature, decreased precipitation, and sea level rise. Madam Speaker, and then they go on to deal with the extreme weather events like hurricane and so on. Agriculture and food security. But before I go on to agriculture and food security, you can recall last year, Madam Speaker, in Coromandel, and the in Cedrus, in which there was a significant landslip. Five houses, had to be, people had to be removed from that area directly related to the changes in the sea level and also the kind of undermining of the, the geography of that area. So it is happening. I think my colleague, the member from Maruga Table and spoke of his own personal experience in Maruga Table, in, in Maruga where he taught previously. In the area of agriculture and food security, projected climate change impacts are expected to negatively affect the agricultural sector nationwide, with anticipated more pronounced effect in the central to southern parts of Trinidad compared to other areas and Tobago. The vulnerability of the agricultural systems and the continued reliance of Trinidad and Tobago on imports of staples such as wheat and maize, coupled with the declines in domestic agriculture, is an important consideration for climate change planning. It was determined that the highest risks from climate change are from sea level rise and storm surge with associated flooding and damage to fish landing sites and fisheries infrastructure. Madam Speaker, the following communities were identified as those being most vulnerable to this risk. Salibia mm. and Balandra, Blanchichez, Claxton Bay, Tobago, Charlottesville, coastal and low-lying areas, and that therefore there was need for intervention in that area. One speaker, water resources, mm. freshwater resources. There are 55 watersheds in Trinidad and 15 in Tobago. Large-scale development of surface water has been limited to four rivers in, in Trinidad and Tobago. These are the Kearney and the Oropooch, in Trinidad North Basin, the Navit River in Trinidad Central Ridge, and Hillsborough River in Tobago, which is the principal supply for Scarborough and Southwest Tobago. Projections suggest an increase in intense rainfall events over shorter periods that will result in lower surface water quality. Reduction in the recharge of groundwater as runoff would be at a maximum, while increase in longer dry spells and drought events coupled with warmer temperatures, which would increase ag agricultural irrigation demands and affect crop scheduling, increase health impacts, coral bleaching, and saline intrusion. 
It was determined that the highest risk from climate change are from the variation in precipitation, resulting in more instances of water contamination as pollution control systems are not designed to deal with variations resulting in increase of pollution and sedimentation of water resources. The technical working group, Madam Speaker, determined that the following communities are most, are most vulnerable to this risk. Kearney River Basin, 15 watersheds, and Southwest Tobago. Madam Speaker, so when, we, when you recognize that there is a problem in this area, you, from the statements of the Water and Sewage Authority, the major reservoirs in Trinidad are below average. And we are in the month of November, almost finished into December. And there, there is insufficient rainfall. Then, as any self-respecting administration, you will need to put a contingency plan in place. The reservoir levels are so low that there's, signif there's alarm. There should be alarm. There is a is alarm, but I get the impression, Madam Speaker, that the, the leaders of the Water and Sewage Authority, they are praying for rain. That is their response. So, in the, so the CEO, Mr. Poon King, and went to store the Hollis Reservoir and talk about its levels, 22%, lower than ever. That, but they are praying for rain. Praying for rain. And if rain doesn't come, what is the plan? Hmm. What is the plan? Cape Town, Madam Speaker, went, the capital of South Africa, went on a water rationing program this July. The people were without water. My colleague, the member for Maruga Tableland, talked about in the crisis there is opportunity. So we are facing a crisis, but you do not wait till the crisis comes. Let us deal and put together a plan, inform the public now as to what is your plan for the dry season of 2020. Nothing is happening. There's only lamentation. The rain falling in places otherwise than where it is in the catchment area. Madam Speaker, in, in the World Bank study entitled High and Dry, Climate change, water, and the economy. A World Bank publication. Madam Speaker, at page one of this executive summary of this study, it states, the impacts of climate change will be channeled primarily through the water cycle, with consequences that could be large and uneven across the globe. Water-related climate risks cascade through food, energy, urban, and environmental systems. Growing population, rising incomes, and expanding cities will converge upon a world where the demand for water rises exponentially while supply becomes more erratic and uncertain. If current water management po policies persist and climate models prove correct, water scarcity will proliferate to regions where currently does not exist, and will greatly worsen in regions where water is already scarce. Simultaneously, rainfall is projected to become more variable and less predictable, while warmer seas will fuel more violent floods and storm surges. Climate change will increase water-related shocks on top of already demanding trends in water use, reduce fresh water availability and competition from other uses, such as energy and agriculture, could reduce water availability in cities by as much as two-thirds by 2050 compared to 2015 levels. Madam Speaker, we don't have to wait for 2050 to see the reduction in levels and the variability of the water. It is happening to us in 2019 into 2020. And then they speak about, in this same article, Madam Speaker, the, that economic growth is, is impacted upon, and they indicate economic growth is surprisingly a thirsty business. 
Water is a vital factor of production, so diminishing water supplies can translate into slower growth and, and cloud, that cloud economic prospects. Madam Speaker, some regions could see their growth rates decline by as much as 6% of GDP by 2050. You have 15 more minutes to wind up your presentation. Might I ask if you are likely to go beyond 430? I want to complete. If OK, I so can I ask members, it will take him just beyond the 430. Is there agreement that the member will All sit right. at? Mm -hmm. Please proceed. Thank you, members, and thank you for your. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So managing water, Madam Speaker, is an important point. Climate change, coupled with human population growth and increasing water demand, will create more challenges for managing water for beneficial human use. Managing water for human use has always been a challenge and expensive activity. Humans will, will need to adapt to increased flooding in some areas and increased drought in others. But, Madam Speaker, just for purposes of our own indi indication here, in Trinidad, the water managers, and I quote from, from Climate Change Causes Effects and Solutions by John T. Hardy, a summary of recommendations for water managers from the American Water Works Association Public Advisory Committee. While water management sy systems are often flexible, adaptation to a new hydrologic conditions may come at a substantial economic cost. Water agencies should begin now to re-examine engineering design assumptions, operation rules, system organization, and contingency planning for existing and planned water management systems under a wider range of climatic conditions that tra than traditionally used. Water agencies and providers should explore the vulnerability of both structural and non-structural water system to plausible future climate changes, not just past climatic vulnerability. Government at all levels should reevaluate legal, technical, and economic approaches to managing water resources in the light of possible climate changes. Water agencies should cooperate with leading scientific organizations to facilitate the exchange of information on the state-of-the-art thinking about climate change and its impact on water resources. Madam Speaker, nothing like that is happening in Trinidad. What the Water and Storage Authority is currently doing is praying for rain. They have become, they have become uh, how can I, evangelical in their quest for rain. Human health, and I go back to the variability, the vulnerability and capacity assessment report. Madam Speaker, human health, and they, they speak about chikungunya and Zika and the increase in that. What is the response of the inspector, insect vector control division of the Ministry of Health? They are very reactive, never proactive. Only when you have uh, uh, chikungunya, uh, Zika taking place, they spray around the place. Now there has to be greater investment in that sector and therefore a much more proactive and leadership approach and training that is necessary in that area. And they point out to the various areas that are, are vulnerable, Tunapuna, Piaco, Pinal, Debe, Cuba, Tabaki, Talparo, Siparia, Port of Spain, Digo Martin, Sandy Grande, and Tobago. Ma Madam Speaker, so, and then they deal with the impacts on the f financial areas. But Madam Speaker, what is the world doing? What is, how are they taking an approach to what is our really existentialist reality. They are taking an approach, Madam Speaker, and if I were to use the OECD and their, 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 their most recent report, accelerating climate change, refocusing policy, policies through a well-being lens, they are taking a different approach. They are saying that now you need to have a different paradigm, that the approach to GDP, I think my colleague, spoke about it, the Honorable Member for Tableland, says that you move, you, you need to take a different approach, that you cannot rape the environment and have production. They are saying you have to take a well-being approach and look through climate change and mitigation action and abatement action through 
the lens of well-being of the people. Madam Speaker, and when you're at page 19 of this report, accelerating climate action, refocusing policies through a well-being lens, and they, they look at heavy industry, they look at residential communities, they look at the uh, transport, and they look at agriculture. Those are the areas that they look and they focus on because they are saying worldwide and globally, 60% of the greenhouse gases are created by these four or five areas. But this is what, and this is a woman I admire enormously, Madam Speaker, in the way she dealt with the terrorist matter, but her name is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, who argued at the World Economic Forum that well-being should be the metric used to gauge societal progress instead of GDP. On 30th May 2019, the New Zealand launched its well-being budget, explicitly contrasting this new approach with traditional measures of succession, such as GDP. The, the budget required new governmental spending to be directed towards five social goals, mental health, improving child well-being, supporting the aspirations of indigenous people, building a productive nation, and transforming the economy, including climate change mitigation. All new spending will be assessed against 61 indicators to measure well-being. The, the, uh, the approach aims to foster cross-government cooperation to achieve these goals while addressing fiscal sustainability, infrastructure investment, and support for the economy. So while we speak in this island of a whole approach to government, what you have there what you have there is really an integrated approach to governance and action on climate change, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, <coughs> Madam Speaker, look, what we are faced with is really a real threat. And what we are doing, we are tinkering all through. The tinkering? And nobody willing to take on big business in Trinidad. For example, the beverage container. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know that it was it floundered because of the intervention of big of big business. And I was, I was the, the leader of government business. I know that it has been it has been stymied, but we look forward to it coming forward. We look forward for it coming forward. We also so we are all in this together, Madam Speaker. And that therefore we must appreciate that climate change is, is something that is, that is envelop enveloping all of us, and it targets all of us, and that we must all share in that responsibility so we do not all share in the suffering. Greta Thunberg, mm. the young lady, you have to admire her. You have to look at what she galvanized youth activism in this area. And whilst I looked at her and watched her operate and saw the energy because there's a real fear amongst young people that the society that they will inherit will not be a society that they can have a sustainable future. And in his 2015 speech, Madam Speaker, the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, famously highlighted a key challenge facing climate action. The tragedy of the horizon in which the catastrophic impacts of climate change will be felt beyond the traditional horizons of most actors, imposing a cost on future generations that the current generation has no direct incentive to fix. So you, we place in a stark that there is no immediate incentive to fix it. It requires leadership involvement. So it requires some kind of collective action on our, on our part. It requires a leadership. Why, why isn't there a, select, a joint select committee appointed to deal with action to deal with climate change in Trinidad and Tobago? Or some blue ribbon committee to deal with it in order that we bring to bear the learning that is available in order to bring to bear the fact of the matter that there is need for resolve and there is need for action in this area. But we have been, to a large extent, running around the mulberry bush. Madam, Madam Speaker, as I conclude, 
I want to thank my colleague, the Honorable Member for County Central, for bringing this motion. But it is time we take action, and there is need. There is we. There are few matters in which we all are our minds meet together, and this is one action that where there is a meeting of the minds, but there is need for a mechanism. And I suggest a committee or a joint select committee of the government and the opposition and business to deal with this matter. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honourable members, it's now 4.29.38, so it's a convenient time. So I suggest we now take the suspension. We shall resume at 5 p.m.